Good morning, everyone. This is group two, and uh, we will be presenting our final graduation project uh, in vehicle using machine learning under the supervision of Dr. Ahmed Rof and Dr. Hisham uh, Arai. Presentation will go as follows. We will first uh, give you a brief overview of our target area of research and motivation, as well as our literature survey and uh, our data set logistics. as well as, of course, our uh, system architecture. Uh, we will then go through um, our experiments and some um, performance uh, me measurements, as well as our, fi finally, uh, a demo and a, how we achieved our empowerment outcomes, which was mainly a To give a brief overview of our um, target area of research, our project mainly aims to uh, tackle in vehicle violence detection, which has been a relatively um, Detected field in the area of motion detection in research and practice. Additionally, uh, violence and harassment in vehicles has been uh, grossly underreported. Uh, um, and lastly, another motivator was that uh, with the rise of autonomous vehicles, there will be a great need when it extends to um, tends to um, um, Tends to uh, ride hailing services, there will be a need to monitor for the sake of passengers' privacy. And as I previously mentioned, due to the uh, research gap of violence detection in vehicles, uh, this, this is due to the privacy and legislation issues that arise um, due to monitoring in private um, areas such as vehicles. Therefore, to tackle this, uh, informed consent and um, camera activation will be left up to the vehicle stakeholders. As for our literature survey, um, the diagram you can see mostly uh, highlights the prominent patterns that we have found within our research, um, which mainly found that uh, a bulk uh, uh, motion detection research is usually composed of uh, recurrent neural networks, such as long short term memory networks, as well as um, other uh, support vector machines and other deep learning techniques. Um, anomaly detection and uh, transfer learning uh, on pre-trained modules are also relatively common. Um, on the other hand, we also surveyed uh, a set of uh, benchmark data sets in order to um, abide by while creating our uh, own data set. Lastly, to summarize, uh, this is a list of uh, some of the most common as well as some of the uh, state-of-the-art um, approaches to machine uh, violence, violence detection and motion detection. Um, colleague Ismail will now uh, walk you through uh, a benchmark uh, research that has influenced our study. Okay, uh, so uh, in the literature, uh, there is specifically one example that was very relative or related to our work or the area that you wanted to work on. And that uh, work was presented by Egosto and his colleagues in 2020. Uh, that work, uh, we will refer to it uh, in our presentation as the uh, Bosch paper, uh, simply because it was funded uh, or sponsored by Bosch. Uh, so that Bosch paper uh, basically targeted uh, the detection of violence inside vehicles uh, using anomaly detection, uh, which we are going to explain in a short bit. Uh, and uh, they made uh, their own data set. However, their data set was uh, private and it was not allowed to be used in public and it was not publicly available. Uh, the work presented by Augusto and his colleagues depended on uh, a work that was presented earlier by Chong and his colleagues in 2017, uh, which is the anomaly detection uh, network uh, for video. Uh, the anomaly detection is different than the action recognition in principle because action recognition uh, aims at classification, which means that you enter a uh, volume of frames into a system and it gets you a classification score for each class. However, the anomaly detection is uh, quite different because in anomaly detection, uh, you only, uh, the only target is to know if a video is anomalous or not. If the model has seen some uh, videos that look like this video or not. Uh, so that's the main aim of uh, anomaly detection. So in anomaly detection, yeah, we enter the video and the aim of the network is to reconstruct the same original video. And uh, then we compare the original video and the output video to know if this video is anomalous or not. 
So how do we know that? The training set is only composed of the normal videos, the, the non-anomalous videos. Uh, and when the network is composed of the, only, the, no, the normal videos only, uh, the network will learn how to reconstruct the normal videos. So in the testing set, when we are uh, entering a uh, testing video that is anomalous to the, to the model, it will not be able to reconstruct it. So we measure uh, the loss of reconstruction as the uh, Euclidean distance between the output video and the uh, entered video. And then we uh, calculate an anomaly score uh, for that purpose uh, to know if the video is anomalous or not. So the network is shown here uh, to the right uh, on this slide. Uh, an input frame is composed of 10 frames, uh, rescaled to, two, uh, to 227 pixels by 227 pixels. Uh, and the, the network is composed of three parts, a spatial encoder, a uh, temporal encoder, and temporal decoder, and a uh, spatial uh, encoder. Uh, and spatial decoder, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, basically, as it can be seen on the left-hand side, uh, the area highlighted in red is the area where the uh, video is normal. And the area highlighted in white is where the anomaly score uh, is really high. So when the anomaly score is really high, we know that uh, the video is uh, anomalous. Uh, and now uh, I'm going. And the the reason basically we uh, are focusing on this work is that we're going. We used it in our uh, work, and we uh, tried to compare between this model and other model models used in action recognition. And now I'll leave the floor to my friend Yusuf to uh, expl explain our research hypotheses. Here you can see our two research hypotheses. Uh, we use these in, in basically designing our experimental setup as well as uh, creating our data set. Uh, the first hypothesis directly challenges uh, Bosch's state-of-the-art approach in detecting in-vehicle violence. Uh, whereby we've hypothesized that a supervised learning approach would result in better results compared to the paper's semi-supervised anomaly uh, detection mechanism. Uh, and to test this hypothesis, as Ismail just explained, we have actually reconstructed the Bosch model uh, in order to compare it to our model as well. Uh, and we'll be discussing that later in the presentation. The second hypothesis on the right-hand side is basically, basically states that uh, using a CNN with an LSTM layer, uh, rationally would produce uh, better results compared to a CNN only given the additional gain in temporal uh, information. Uh, and the two hypotheses have actually been proven to be correct. And the exact details of the experiments uh, will be discussed later in the presentation. However, for now, I'm going to walk you through our data set uh, creation phase. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to restate that we've collected the entire data set from a TV show called Crazy Taxi, uh, hence the data set's name, Crazy Taxi data set. Uh, so special thanks to Assam Kafafi, the producer, for granting us his approval to use the episodes. So now looking at the, uh, the slide we have here, we can see two diagrams on the right-hand side. Uh, looking at the pie chart at the bottom right corner, uh, it clearly shows our data split. We have basically two classes uh, where violence uh, comprises roughly 22% of our data uh, and non-violence uh, comprises around 78% of our data. And the bar chart on the top simply shows our progress since uh, thesis one. Uh, we managed to expand our data set from around 1,000 clips to roughly 1,500 clips uh, that we have now with an average, average length of 5.2 seconds uh, and we have roughly 200,000 frames uh, worth of data. Before proceeding any further, I'd like to show you two examples from our data set. Uh, just a quick explanation, explanation here. Our annotation is basically, since we have two camera angles, uh, L represents left uh, camera angle, R represents the right camera angle. And N represents our nonviolent class, while V represents the violent class. And the hash is basically a, a placeholder for the ID number of the video. As you can see here, this is a nonviolent example taken from the left corner of the car. 
this is a violent example. Just to clarify, we've defined violence in our research basically as anything ranging from any physical interaction, basically ranging from simple uh, touches all the way to fights, as you can see here in this video. Okay, so here you can see a comprehensive comparison with the different violence data sets that we, were, uh, that we exposed in the literature. Looking at our data set at the very last row, we can confidently say that we match the standards set by the leading data sets in the literature. We rank third in terms of size. However, larger data sets such as the UCF have clips that are nearly six minutes long, uh, which is incredibly difficult to train and test a machine learning model with. Uh, knowing that, we've created our data set with an average clip length of 5.2 seconds. Uh, and additionally, our videos provide the highest resolution and more importantly, they're annotated at a clip level rather than at the frame level. It's worth noting that most of the data sets here shown uh, are those of general violence with variable scenarios and camera angles that are not particularly relevant uh, to the confined nature of cars, uh, which is why I'm going to be comparing in the next slide specifically with the Bosch data set. So basically here we have uh, two tables. Uh, the table on the top is a quantitative comparison and the table, uh, the table uh, at the bottom is a qualitative comparison. Uh, notably, the Bosch data set is extremely biased towards violence, which isn't really representative of uh, real daily life scenarios, unlike our data set. Uh, our data set is also far more complex uh, and exhaustive, with some clips having four times as many subjects compared to Bosch, which only have at most two subjects uh, per clip. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to stress on the fact that we're using two different camera angles, both of which cover the front and the rear seats, whereas the Bosch data set, as you can see, only covers the rear seat. Uh, and our car is also moving, to the, so we have variable lighting sources uh, that we use in training our model, basically. Now, looking at this slide, we have our different pre-processing stages before actually feeding the, the data to the model. Our first stage is simply the input RGB video clip that has been annotated and classified. Uh, the second stage uh, is anonymization. Basically, it's uh, to address the ethical, uh, the ethical problems that were raised during thesis one regarding human subjects' faces being exposed in our data. So we've used uh, a deep privacy generative adversary network to obscure the human faces, and we'll be discussing this in deeper detail uh, shortly. However, the third stage, uh, as you can see, is motion analysis, and this is the core of our pre-processing. Uh, we use a background uh, subtraction mechanism on a frame-by-frame -frame basis to identify and isolate the moving objects, and this results in a binary frame where the white blobs or the white region represent the moving objects. Uh, and the black background is, uh, is simply uh, the still, uh, still not moving objects. The fourth and fifth st stages are, uh, are basically morphological operations to eliminate any uh, random white noise uh, that's present in the frame. Uh, and, and the dilation as, as, as it appears here is, uh, is basically an operation to enlarge the region of interest to help our model train better. And lastly, the input, as I just explained, is a binary video clip. Uh, and we'll be seeing examples right now. Uh, but before, before I discuss the example, this is uh, sort of a high level snapshot of the deep privacy architecture that we used. Uh, it uses face detection and pose estimation uh, to, to basically identify where the face is located and then it feeds the location to a generative model that transforms the face and obscures uh, the subject's identity. These are examples for the deep privacy model after, before and after. So this was after the deep privacy and this is before. You can see that the pieces are randomly changing because they're it's it's on a frame by by frame basis, so each frame has a different uh, a different phase basically. Lastly, here's an example of the motion analysis, as I just explained. Uh, the top row shows the original data before any pre-processing, and the bottom row shows the data after pre-processing with the binary frames 
where the white region is, uh, is showing a hand here in this example, uh, and it's moving towards the driver, uh, which basically represents a violent uh, scenario. Now my, my colleagues will be discussing the exact experimentation setup. Uh, now we'll be uh, beginning our discussion of the results we got with the different models. Uh, the model we see here is the anomaly detection model as developed in the Bosch paper. Here we can see that 10 grayscaled images are fed into a convolutional neural network, which we will be describing shortly, after which it's fed into a temporal uh, encoder as described by my colleague Ismail. And in the second half of the model, it tries to reconstruct the 10 original frames. And based on the difference between the 10 original frames and the uh, uh, produced frames, it, uh, it creates an anomaly score ranging from zero to one with a threshold in between uh, above which the video is considered anomalous. As we can see here on the results on the far right, we see the, the recall score, which are the true positive rate as in videos that were in fact violent and classified as such. We can see this model is very successful in classifying videos as such. However, the precision, a measure of how many of the frames uh, classified as violent were in fact such is uh, fairly low at 29%. This indicates that the model is successful in detecting violence. However, it often classifies nonviolent scenarios as violent. This is probably due to the qualitative differences between uh, our paper and the data set or our model, our data set and the model used in the Bosch paper. Uh, our model uses much more, uses multiple angles, has many more participants and has different lighting scenarios. This makes it so that the, that it's much more difficult for the model to converge and to reconstruct the model due to how uh, different the different frames can be from each other. Moreover, we can see that the accuracy is uh, fairly middling and the F score, which is a measure that combines both the precision and the F score is also relatively low. Uh, this is the first model that we began to test. We can see here on the left, we input a video clip frame of size 255 by 255, after which it is passed into ResNet 50, which is a convolutional neural network or a CNN, which is used for object recognition. Here the CNN extracts features from the images. At first, basic features such as lines and then moving on to shapes and then higher level objects it might, it might find in a car such as seats, arms, and etc. cetera. Uh, ResNet 50, just to note, is a pre-trained pre model used for object recognition that we used as is. Uh, to transfer the to transfer what it learned in object recognition to our uh, case, in the end we see the fully the FC layers or the fully connected layers, which takes these features in from the from the convolutional layers, and then decide then uses it to make a decision. Finally, making a decision whether this frame this individual frame is either nonviolent or violent. We can see here that the recall scores uh, is below that of the anomaly detection method. However, the accuracy and precision are significantly higher, indicating that we can be much more confident in the results this model gives us compared to the anomaly detection system. However, it's still important to note that given the nature of our data set and the nature of our problem, the recall score, the recall, the recall score is still critical, given that it's better to classify some nonviolent cases as violent rather than to miss violent cases due to the seriousness uh, of such a situation. I'll be now handing off to my colleague Ismail to present the rest of the models. Okay, so now we uh, introduced an LSTM. An LSTM stands for a long short term memory and it is a type of neural network that uh, tends to make uh, to know the relations between different frames in, uh, on a temporal scale. Uh, that means it knows the differences with time. Uh, so we used uh, two models with LSTMs, a frame level model and a clip level model. The frame level model, it uh, takes a single frame and gives a classification score for uh, each frame, while the clip level model, it takes a volume or a series of frames and gives uh, a single classification score for each volume. Uh, so we introduced the LSTM uh, just after the uh, ResNet 50 archite architecture and uh, before the fully connected layers. And uh, as you can see here in the table, uh, the accuracy we got was almost the same as uh, the, C the ResNet 50 without an LSTM. Uh, but the recall was uh, a little bit higher.
And now this is the clip level LST, uh, ResNet 50 with an LSTM. Uh, for this model, uh, the input was a 32 uh, volume uh, of, clear, of frames, uh, where there was a sliding, vi a video, a sliding window uh, for each clip for, uh, to produce the data set that was entered into the model. So for example, we took uh, for, uh, for each clip, we took uh, from frames from one to 32, from two to 33, from three to 34, and so on and so forth. Uh, to produce the volumes that were uh, used as a data set and as an input to the model. Uh, so that's in the training phase. In the testing phase, uh, as you can see, the number of test samples is significantly lower. That's uh, simply because in the testing phase, we didn't uh, only depend on the classification score uh, that each volume uh, produced. However, we uh, gave a classification for each clip as a whole. So we saw the number of subclips uh, or 32, uh, 32 frame windows in each clip that were classified as violent and as non-violent. Non and then we compared the, those two numbers and gave a label for each uh, clip as a whole, whether it was uh, violent or non-violent. And uh, the number of test samples you see here is the uh, number of the testing uh, clips in our data set. And it's not like the previous uh, models where uh, th this number of test samples was uh, the number of frames. And as you can see, the accuracy uh, is a little bit lower. Uh, the recall is also a little bit lower. So uh, now we'll summarize all the models that we have used. Uh, the most important uh, two metrics are the accuracy and the recall in our experiments, uh, simply because, as my colleague Iad has explained before, uh, the recall uh, takes into account that we want the lowest number of false negatives, given the nature of our problem. Uh, and as you can see, the best model that performs is the ResNet 50 plus the fully connected layers without an LSTM, as it gives an accuracy of 92.7% uh, and the recall of 77.5%. Uh, the ResNet 50 plus LSTM uh, on a frame level also performs really good uh, with a 92.9 uh, accuracy and a 82.4 uh, recall. However, it can be seen that the anomaly detection uh, performed uh, worse than the action recognition, uh, which was proved by our initial hypothesis. Uh, also, our first hypothesis also was uh, proved uh, correct, as the ResNet 50 plus LSTM performed slightly better than the ResNet 50 plus the fully connected layers. On the accuracy, it's just a minimal difference with 0.2%, uh, but in the recall, it uh, the difference is very large and it can be seen that the ResNet 50 plus LSTM plus the fully connected layers was much better on a frame level. And now we'll show a demo of uh, our videos as they are classified with the labels uh, shown above the frames. Now I'll leave the floor to my colleague Basil to uh, explain our uh, empowerment outcome, which is the research paper. Okay, uh, as we mentioned, our empowerment outcome is a research paper. So let me guide you through the main sections of our uh, research paper. Uh, first of all, we have the introduction and the problem description section. This section includes uh, an introduction to the targeted problem, as well as the brief description of the solution proposed. Uh, second, we have the literature review. This section discusses all the previous solutions to, to our problem, including data sets used, the architecture of the model design, and uh, all alternative approaches and technologies to solve the, the problem. Uh, the third section is the data set, the organization and specifications. Uh, this section includes the description of our data sets uh, and its specifications, include the, including the size, the organization of the videos, uh, the average clip length and the annotation approach, and also the pre-processing phase. Uh, uh, for the next section, uh, it is the model architecture. In this section, it uh, includes in-depth uh, description of the architecture of all our uh, models uh, th that uh, my colleagues uh, previously discussed. Each model is described separately in a subsection, uh, in a subsection with, uh, with its full technical details and assumptions. Uh, 
Uh, for the next section, we have the experiments and the results. The section this section includes the description of the of, of the experiments and the summary of the results found by conducting those uh, experiments. Uh, finally, we have the discussion of findings. In this section, we try to compensate all the information we have gathered from the experiments and from the literature to conclude about our uh, research hypotheses. Uh, so uh, basically, it includes the, it con contains the conclusion of our research as well as a discussion of its uh, potential uh, applications. Uh, and uh, as a contribution from us to the community, we are willing, inshallah, to uh, publish our work to be publicly av uh, available, including the data set and the architecture of all the models, uh, so that anyone can benefit from our work and build on it. Uh, accordingly, we have uh, prepared a list of uh, conferences and journals that uh, we are considering uh, while uh, publishing. Uh, for the conferences, we have the, the IEEE Intelligent Vehicles Symposium, uh, the National Conference of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, uh, the International Conference on uh, Machine Learning, and the IEEE Conference on, com uh, on Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition. Uh, we are mostly interested in the first one, which will have it, uh, its 33rd round uh, on the next uh, June. Uh, as uh, for uh, the journals, uh, we, we have all to uh, looked into some uh, scientific peer-reviewed uh, journals in the in the uh, in the field of computer science, and uh, uh, here are some journals that we might consider: the IEEE Transactions on Neural Network and Learning Systems, the Journal of Machine Learning Research, the Computer Journal, and Journal of uh, Artificial Intelligence uh, Research. Those journals uh, uh, they have a, they have a, one publication monthly, uh, and the Computer Journal uh, have uh, have it weekly. Uh, now I would like to open uh, the floor for any questions or recommendations. <laughs>